Welcome to the listener's commentary on the New Testament. Your guide is pastor and theologian Dr. John Whitaker, and the heart behind these studies is to help you better understand the text of Scripture so you can more fully live it out. It's all about helping you learn and live the Bible. Here is the book of John. All right, welcome to the listener's commentary on the Gospel of John. If you're not familiar with the listener's commentary, it is a listener-supported, crowd-funded Bible teaching ministry that is made possible by the generosity of dozens of folks all around the world. So thanks a ton to those of you who make this ministry possible. And as of the time of this recording, we have 22 of 27 New Testament books complete. We have the Gospel of John, Letters of John, Book Revelation, to finish up the entire New Testament. So thanks a ton for making this possible. And in this recording, we are beginning the Gospel of John. And that means we're going to start with the backstory and kind of introduction to this unique Gospel. So if you're familiar with the Gospels at all, you know there are four of them, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The first three, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, are typically referred to as the synoptic gospels, synoptic. And that word means to see together, to see with, or to see the same way. So Matthew, Mark, and Luke are very similar in their style and their content as far as how they tell the story of Jesus. John, the gospel of John, stands out as very different. Whereas the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they focus on Jesus' ministry in Galilee, John tends to show more of his activity in and around Jerusalem. Whereas Matthew, Mark, and Luke have lots of small little snapshots all stitched together, John tends to focus on larger scenes and larger dialogues. Not only that, John actually seems to intentionally leave out some of the well-known stories from the Synoptic Gospels, almost as if he was like, well, that material's been well-documented, so we don't need to go over that again. And he includes instead a number of other stories that themselves have become well-known and well-loved, stories that are only found in his gospel, stories like the woman at the well or the raising of Lazarus. These stories are only found in the gospel of John. And as with all of the gospels, there's a lot of the backstory that is technically unknown and That's the case with John, and we have to rely on external sources like the early church fathers right after the time period of John's life to fill in the gaps. So let me just give you what I think is the most likely story lying behind John's gospel, the backstory to John that makes the most sense from all the data available to us. The story goes something like this. It's been 60 years since Jesus walked the hills of Galilee and the streets of Jerusalem. And one of Jesus' closest friends and closest disciples is John. He's now an old man and he's living far away from where he grew up and far away from where he met Jesus and walked with Jesus. He's living in the city of Ephesus far to the west. And he's been leading for and caring for the church there in Ephesus and the surrounding area for a number of years. And since it's been so long since the early days of the church, new challenges to faith in Jesus have arisen. It seems like one of these challenges that's causing problems for those Christians in the area where John is working is this false idea that doubted the humanity of Jesus. It's often referred to by scholars as docetism. It's the idea that Jesus may have been God, but he certainly wasn't fully human. And it separates those two, and there were various formulations for how that was arranged. So John, in telling his story, shows how Jesus is uniquely God's very own son, God himself, but at the same time, he's also fully human. John intends to help his readers see that Jesus is fully God and fully man, and that this false idea that doubts his full humanity is indeed false. He also wants to help people see how Jesus fulfills the themes of the Hebrew Scriptures and the feasts of the Hebrew Scriptures in a distinctive and unique sort of way. And the aim of all of this is to bring people to believe that Jesus is indeed the Son of God and that by believing they might come to have real true life in his name. That's the backstory to the Gospel of John in a nutshell. Now, let's break it down into some of the key details. So, Who wrote the Gospel of John? 
Well, the best answer to that, the most common answer is the Apostle John wrote it. The earliest tradition of the church is that the Apostle John, the son of Zebedee, wrote this gospel, and they, he also wrote the letters that have his name as well, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. And all the evidence that we have fits with that claim. For example, what's often called the external evidence, that is evidence from outside the gospel, evidence from outside the Bible. Here's a quote from an early church leader by the name of Irenaeus, who lived and served the church between 130 and 200 AD. He was a church leader in the city of Lyons, and he actually heard Polycarp, who knew John personally, it was taught by him, and testified that John, the disciple of the Lord, who also leaned against his chest, had himself published a gospel during his residence in Ephesus in Asia. And that was written sometime around 185 AD. This is Irenaeus' testimony based on what he heard from Polycarp. And Polycarp himself had been taught by John. So this would be like uh, an older person taught me, and then I taught someone younger than me the way of Jesus. It's not very far removed from John's time at all. John had taught Polycarp, Polycarp had taught Irenaeus, and now Irenaeus was writing this down in his own lifetime. That's the testimony of the early church. And all the internal evidence, that is all the stuff within the gospel, agrees with this testimony that John the Apostle wrote it. Uh, we can tell from reading the gospel that the author was a Jew, a Jew accustomed to thinking in Aramaic, the language of Palestine or Israel in the first century, even though the gospel was written in Greek. Not only that, the gospel is deeply rooted in the Hebrew scriptures and in the Jewish way of life. Uh, for example, he was acquainted with the Jewish feast. He even took the time in the gospel to explain some details of the Jewish feast to his readers. The author was familiar with the details of Galilee and Jerusalem. Little details like you find in chapter 11, verse 18, where he says, Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, only about two miles off. Or little details like you find in John 18, 1, where he describes where the Garden of Gethsemane was, over the ravine of the Kidron, where there was a garden. You find places in the Gospel of John where Hebrew or Aramaic words are inserted, but then they're explained for non-Aramaic speakers. And so the author was very familiar with the world of the first century in Israel or in Palestine. He's familiar with Aramaic. He's a Jew who's deeply rooted in thinking Aramaic thoughts and deeply rooted in the Hebrew scriptures. Not only that, it seems pretty clear from the gospel that he was an eyewitness of the events which he recorded. That was actually his claim. You see it in chapter 1, verse 14. We beheld his glory. He's claiming to be an eyewitness. Or again, in 1935, where he says, he who has seen has borne witness and his testimony is true. And so he claims to be an eyewitness of the events that he records. And you can see that he's giving eyewitness testimony in some of the small little details, small little touches that he includes. For example, the number and the size of the, the stone pots at the wedding in Cana in chapter 2, or the hour that Jesus sat on the curb of the well in John chapter 4, or even the weight and the value of the ointment that Mary used to anoint Jesus. These are all incidental and small little details, the kinds of things that an eyewitness would throw in. Not only that, the author describes himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved, and he was with Jesus at the Last Supper. He was near Jesus at his trial. He was there at the foot of the cross when Jesus crucified. And so he inserts himself into the story, and there's no reason to doubt the accuracy of his claim. He must have been one of Jesus' closest disciples who was there for his whole ministry. But James, one of the early disciples, was actually killed very early on, beheaded by Herod Agrippa. You can read that in Acts chapter 12. Peter and Thomas and John, a few other very uh, close disciples of Jesus, well, they're mentioned over and over again in the gospel in the third person, so they can't be the author. Therefore, the most likely candidate is John, and that's what all the testimony and all the evidence points to. So let's talk a little bit about who John was. John was one of the sons of Zebedee. His brother was James. And 
James and John grew up in the little village of Bethsaida as fishermen. And it seems like their fishing business was a fairly good business, must have been fairly productive. They were actually partners with Peter and Andrew, two of the other early apostles. They also, according to Mark chapter 1, verse 20, had hired workers in their fishing business. And so they had a fairly lucrative or productive fishing business there on the Sea of Galilee in the north. And John and his brother James were actually given a nickname by Jesus. Do you remember what that nickname was? It's Sons of Thunder. We find that in Mark 3, 17. They were the Sons of Thunder because they wanted to call down fire on the Samaritan village who rejected Jesus and didn't let them stay there. And so Jesus gave them that nickname. During the trial, John got into the court of the high priest because his family was known to the high priestly family. So there was some sort of connection with the high priestly family, people of clout and wealth and power in, uh, in and around Jerusalem. And John lived and served Jesus for a very long time, at some point moving from Israel to Asia Minor, to the, the large and populous city of Ephesus. And before his death, he was, at least for a period of time, exiled by the Romans to the island of Patmos off the coast of Asia Minor. His death came sometime in the late first century when he would have been well into his 80s. Now, when was the Gospel of John written? And if we're going to be honest, we have to say we don't know for sure. In the 1800s, during the heyday of higher criticism of the Bible, it was actually common among critics of the New Testament to say that the Gospel of John had to be written very late, usually in the second century, they would say, because it had such an, a lofty and exalted view of Jesus. And, well, you know, it takes time for such legends to develop. And that all seemed well and good and hard to refute until a tiny little fragment of the Gospel of John was discovered, the John Rylands fragment. And that fragment is dated to no later than 125 or 130. And it includes a little portion of John 1831 through 33, as well as verse 37. It's a small little fragment. But its date was very powerful because it meant that the Gospel of John had to be copied and circulated widely enough by 125 to 130 that there could be a copy in Egypt by that time period. And so the Gospel of John had to be written early enough to have been copied multiple times and to arrive in Egypt by 125 to 130. And so estimates range for when it was written sometime between A.D. 65 all the way to A.D. 95. We, again, we don't know for sure. The most common date, however, is sometime between 85 to 95. Towards the end of the first century, a good 55 to 65 years after the life of Jesus. And why did John write this gospel? What was his purpose in, in writing it? Well, it stands out as very distinct from the other three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And as to the purpose, we don't have to wonder. John actually tells us why he wrote it. So this is incredibly helpful. He says this in John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31. He writes, So then, many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book. But these have been written, and here's the purpose statement, so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. That's why John wrote his gospel. He wrote to lead people to faith in Jesus as the Messiah and the Son of God and to having eternal life by believing in him. And so the idea of life is actually very important to John. It shows up in the gospel in multiple places, and it shows up in his letters a number of times. John emphasizes that salvation is life. To have salvation comes by believing in Jesus, and it leads to life, both now and forever. How does John actually go about achieving this purpose? Well, as we noted at the outset of this recording, he emphasizes both the deity and the humanity of Jesus. That's one of the things he seeks to emphasize to show that Jesus is the Son of God. And so passages that emphasize the deity, for example, he describes uh, Jesus as the Word of God who was there in the beginning who created all things. 
He records Jesus as saying, I and the Father are one, John chapter 10, verse 30. He actually has Jesus uh, say, before Abraham was born, I am. Like, Abraham lived 2,000 years before Jesus, and the name of God is I am, and Jesus states that that's who he is. Or Jesus also says that he who has seen me has seen the Father. Or right at the kind of the culmination of the gospel, the uh, apostle Thomas testifies about Jesus after his resurrection, saying, my Lord and my God. And so the gospel emphasizes the deity of Jesus, but also the humanity of Jesus. He shows Jesus is getting very tired and weary and needing to rest, John chapter 4, verse 6, or getting thirsty, John 4, 7, or he shows uh, Jesus' sorrow in chapter 11 and weeping and grieving over the loss of his friends. He shows Jesus expressing appreciation or even his troubledness of heart. All these things uh, demonstrate how Jesus is also fully human as well as fully God. Another thing John does to achieve this purpose of helping people believe in Jesus is he presents seven signs. And the number of seven is this number of completion or fullness. And so seven signs that show who Jesus is. And as you heard in the purpose statement, these signs have been recorded so that you might believe. What are these seven signs? Well, turning the water into wine. John tells us that was his first sign. Healing of the official's son in chapter 4, verse 54. Healing of the lame man at the pool of Bethesda in chapter 5. Feeding the 5,000 in chapter 6. Walking on water as well as in chapter 6. Healing the blind man in John chapter 9. And then raising Lazarus from the dead in John chapter 11. These are the seven signs around which John has shaped his narrative. In addition to that, he's provided a gripping account of Jesus' death and resurrection as the beginning of a new creation. That's the way he structured it, for us to see that this is a new creation. It's like an eighth day, an eighth day where all things are beginning to be made new. In fact, in the initial account of Jesus' resurrection, Mary meets Jesus in a garden, just like the original creation was in a garden. And so it's intentionally designed to help us see that his resurrection is the beginning of a new creation. And then he, he shows how Jesus culminates the story of Israel. He's the true light. He's the true tabernacle or true temple. He's the true living water. He's the true bread from heaven. He's the true Passover. All of this helps us see that the story of Jesus finds its apex and culmination in the person of Jesus himself. And then one other key thing that John does to achieve his purpose is he records seven I am statements from Jesus. Now, these are important because, again, I am is the name that God has given himself in his self-revelation to Moses at the burning bush, right? He is the great I am. Well, Jesus, seven different times in the statement says, I am, and then he attaches some sort of the theme or significance from the Hebrew scriptures to his identity. And so he says in John 6, 35, I am the bread of life. John chapter 8, I am the light of the world. John chapter 10, I am the door for the sheep. John chapter 10 again, I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life, John 11. I am the way, the truth, and the life, John 14. And then in John 15, I am the true vine. And then in addition to all of that, John includes one sort of like ultimate I am statement in John chapter 8, where Jesus says, truly, I tell you, before Abraham was, 2,000 years prior to Jesus, before Abraham existed, I am. No descriptive, no fill in the blank, just an absolute I am statement, I am. And the Jews picked up stones. They wanted to kill him because they recognized the significance of what he said. All of uh, this helps us as readers see who Jesus is. And John's goal in all of that is that by seeing who Jesus is, the Messiah and the Son of God, we might believe in him. And by believing in him, we might have life in his name. That's what the gospel of John is aiming at. And that's what the gospel of John is all about.